Welcome to the We Are Libertarians 2020 presidential candidate series. Uh, we're going to meet one today. We've been doing the debates, but we have a new candidate in the ring. This is Max Abramson. Uh, Max, how are you doing today? Hanging in there. All right. Well, good to hear. Max, thank you so much for uh, joining the show, uh, talking with us, making the time, and throwing your hat into the ring. Uh, we Now, this is part, this first part here, we ask the candidates the same questions every time. Uh, you'll get kind of a mix of questions during the debate. You don't know about them ahead of time. These are all pre-screened, pre-listed questions, really just so we can do an apples to apples comparison between all the other libertarian candidates because uh, we want to hear how they differ. And so the best way to do that is to ask the same questions and then see where the splits are. So uh, let's get started. My first question, this is the only one that's not going to involve politics, so really get it out of your system here. But tell me about yourself personally, just everything outside of the political realm, anything that you would want uh, voters or people to know about you. Uh, well, I, I worked for about 10 or 12 years as a merchant mariner and uh, suffered a back injury, so I had to do a career change. Um, I now work in road construction, but I also do uh, work on the side uh, in software development. So uh, those are two, two probably the least exciting uh, professions you can do. Road construction is uh, just being out there in the hot summer and trying not to get hit by all the people who are busy trying to get home and watch reruns of Matlock. <laughs> no, that's true. That's, uh, I, I tell you, Matlock was a favorite of my, of my grandparents. It was kind of like the SVU of their time. And so I... Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, Perry Mason and uh, Raymond Burr, who played Perry Mason, and I guess he owned an island at one point. Um, and he was interviewed, um, and they said that they he he won every single case except in early in the first season. He had one show where they lost a case. He was defending somebody, and and, and his his client was found guilty, and they received thirty five thousand fan letters saying, "Don't do that." So they never. People were so upset with that episode because it had an unhappy ending. And so they, they could never put on an unhappy ending again. Everyone had to be acquitted from then on. Oh, wow. I, th I don't I think Dick Wolf has ever once given me a happy ending. It's just a tale of two audiences, I guess. <laughs> um, so let's get into it. Uh, what's your Liberty Journey story? Uh, you've actually had a serious uh, uh swing in that recently but uh let's hear your history just your journey towards libertarianism so few people are born into the concept of liberty so just how did you find your way there well i wasn't born into it i think i must have been four or five years old when my older brother asked uh questions about property rights and and one question kind of really stuck out could he asked if you could put uh you know barbed wire and minefields and all kinds of other things on your own property if it's your own property and we lived in an apartment at that time, and, and I, I didn't understand how apartments worked. You know, the, there's the rent is theft crowd, and, and we, you know, I hear some people laughing at them, but I, I, I really like some of the arguments that they use, even if I don't uh, agree with their uh, end conclusion. But uh, we thought of our backyard as our property. And so I was maybe four or five years old. I had just seen some of, you know, my first World War II movies with John Wayne and the other guys. And... They asked that question. He asked that question. Can you put a minefield in, on your own property if it's your own? And that really got me thinking, asking really difficult questions. And if, if, you, if you really think that through, it opens up kind of all the complicated questions of common law, all the issues of what you're allowed to do and uh, uh, how you interact with your neighbors. And it, it, it's not something simple where you just say, no, you can't because you endanger other people. There are there are a lot more issues going on on questions of reasonable use of your own land and unreasonable use. Awesome. And just kind of everything sprung from conversations like that? That, and then when I was in high school, I just by complete accident found a, a worn out book called Free to Choose, a personal statement by Milton and Rose Friedman. And I had been really thinking about economics in terms of how would you organize all economic activity within a country to be the most efficient? And I wanted, personally, wanted the least government control. And Milton Friedman, of course, is famous for the Chicago School uh, versus the more famous uh, Austrian School. And but they really delved into their philosophy first. And after that, I started, of course, reading a lot of uh, uh, quotes and letters by uh, Thomas Jefferson. Um, and then that later, of course, turned me on to 
you know, Benjamin Franklin and uh, Frederick Bastiat and a and, and number of others. And I've read a lot of the uh, uh, books and uh, philosophy on uh, classical liberalism or libertarianism. That was before I got into the Libertarian Party, of course. Yeah. The, uh, so, so what we like to do is we like to start at the top and then work you down from there. So we're going to assume that you've won the presidency uh, uh, for our first few questions here. And so these questions, all three the same, we're just going to have them in order. Biggest problem facing America and how you would fix it, then second and third. But let's start number one, biggest problem that you see facing America. And what does the Max Abram Abramson presidency do for you? Uh, breakdown of the family, same thing that I tried to say during the Johnson Weld campaign. Little side story, I was the uh, legislative sponsor at the New Hampshire State House for the Johnson Weld ticket. We had about 600 people come out and someone, I, I don't want to name names, but I think that it was the campaign manager made a decision right beforehand. It's a long trip out there. There's a lot of work setting it all up. Um, and I was just going to speak literally for a minute on the breakdown of the American family because it, it's been one of the, it's been the biggest issue for me personally, and it's one that we really struggle with. And uh, the legislature, the you know, the, the, there's the, that contribution, the corruption of the family courts, and the easy divorce, and and people throw a lot of different things at it. But I think it's really economic stress that causes most of it. It now takes two incomes to support a family, and when both parents are working and neither one can really take time off kind of wears them out. So I always say uh, create living wage jobs, not welfare. Um, I think the welfare system and its costs have driven poverty up. They've contributed to the breakdown of the family. They discourage people from marrying and the series of welfare clips that they put in place. I grew up in public housing. Uh, my family was on welfare for a couple of years about the time that my father died. And I, I, I saw up close how it uh, contributed to the breakdown of uh, the family unit. Yeah, uh, family is one of those that I think people just don't uh, don't consider as a political issue when they don't see how, how the politics gets in, involved with it and interferes with it. Uh, so let's talk about issue number two and what your uh, administration would do to take care of it. It's uh, the, the not just the current war in uh, Middle East, Syria, Afghanistan, or any specific country, but the ongoing wars in the Middle East. They just seem to be escalating, and ever since September 11th, um, every terrorist attack, every bombing, every uh, uprising by insurgents is being used as the excuse to attack and invade another country and another country, and it's turned into an 18-year-long military conflict there. Um, when I had to decide, I really have pushed this decision kind of down the road a little bit, and procrastinated a bit, but when I had to decide for myself as a person, do I really want to put my name out there and be exposed to all the criticism and the amount of work that goes into it? What would, what really drives you to to do that? And it's bringing the troops home. Um, I, a lot of the guys that I uh, was in Army ROTC with, um, and a lot of the guys I on merchant ships, we took a lot of military hardware, but a lot of military crew out to the Middle East, and. Uh, my thoughts are always with them and their safety and wanting them to uh, be able to come back home, be with their families and their communities. It's not just a matter of cost, the trillions and trillions of dollars for their long-term medical and disability costs. My, my concern is that, that they're separated from their families for so long. Sure. Very uh, economic and human cost on that issue. And let's uh, talk about problem number three and what uh, Max Abramson can do for the average American person. Uh, it's the national debt and the entitlement crisis. Uh, current federal, federal, state, and local spending, I look at all three as, as public spending, it's about $8 trillion a year. Um, and that might seem huge compared to uh, a, you know, a $22 trillion a year economy. Um, but if you imagine the biggest parts of that, not just for federal, but also in, the, in our state budgets, I work as uh, I'm a state legislator. I'm on my second term now as a libertarian state legislator. And the biggest rising cost also for the state, for the school districts, for towns is rising health care costs, rising health care costs uh, and rising costs of college uh, uh, insurance liability. Those types of things are driving up the entitlement crisis. They're driving up the cost of health care. Um, and as bad as the twenty two trillion dollar national debt is, it's actually fast uh, rising towards twenty three trillion. Uh, total unfunded entitlement obligations, pension fund obligations, and infrastructure 
costs are uh, over $70 trillion now, according to a USA Today uh, front page story. Um, and that's a couple of years old. So it, it's, it's going to be much larger than that. Now, to, to put that in perspective, people can't imagine what trillions and trillions of dollars are imagining that amount of money. So I explain it in terms of it's roughly the size of, uh, you know, it's about $300,000 for every man, woman and child in the country. Those are your total obligations that that just Congress, just the federal government has has uh, attached to you. And I don't think that there's any possible way that we can we can manage that. Of course, the solution is to get back to constitutionally limited government, keep the, the basics, the retirement uh, benefits, veterans benefits, uh, disability benefits, Social Security and Medicare benefits. But uh, I think it's pretty clear that all the other uh, entitlement programs sub and uh, subsidies have to be uh, somehow phased out. Sure. I mean, we just when you can't afford it, you can't afford it. Right. Uh, so let's talk about the I got to take the presidency away from you. Let's pretend you've won the libertarian primary. And so what we're going to do is talk about your strategy as far as appeal to the American voters, uh, because you're just going to have a tough time making it on libertarian support alone. And so we're going to kind of talk about how you appeal to the left and the right. So let's start with social issues and let's start with the left. Um, you've got the concern over, you know, uh, gay rights, and this is specifically socially. So not, and we'll get to the economics in just a minute here. But you know, you, you've got you've got all the different issues, the the equality issues, um, treatment, the workplace, uh, how how minorities get treated, uh, and they're concerned about the culture around that. Why would you appeal? Why would a a socially left person vote for you instead of their given Democratic candidates? Well, in the if you look at tactical voting, of course, there are 20, 20 states that now always go Republican. There are fourteen states that uh, always go uh, Democrat, and there are only sixteen battleground states left. So, right there, the twenty uh, states that are expected to always go to go to Trump or always go Republican. I think that. Those are pretty easy to pick up just on uh, talking about LGBT rights. Um, that's a simple libertarian versus uh, Trump or Abramson versus Trump uh, uh, calculus. And uh, um, I think that uh, issues like the death penalty, um, I spoke on the floor recently in favor for the repeal of the death penalty and the repeal of the death penalty passed by one vote, my vote in New Hampshire. And we were able to accomplish that. And I think that people underestimate the importance of that, that that's a very important issue because of the growing awareness of wrongful convictions. Um, I've been a long time, hundred percent supporter of LGBT rights, including uh, the lesser known ones like hospital visitation and uh, bereavement rights as governor Bill Well did had to stick his neck out uh, as governor of Massachusetts and do as an executive order, um, do it on his own with opposition from a Democrat legislature. Um, so the, the, the death penalty uh, protection of civil liberties, um, privacy, internet privacy, phone privacy, email privacy. A lot of social liberals have brought those up as uh, issues that, that they're concerned about and are very near and dear to them. And I think that more and more social liberals are really starting to question um, in the 14 uh, entrenched Democrat states, the safe blue wall states, which are about 240 electoral college votes. I think they're starting to question whether or not the Democrat Party is really a, a free speech party or is it just another talking points party. Uh, I think that political correctness and uh, the loss of free speech on the Democrat side is really driving away a lot of social liberals from there, from that party. Yeah, yeah, totally agree. So let's talk about the the socially the right. Um, they're very concerned. Obviously, they've seen church rights erode away. We've seen um, some of their outreach efforts fail. Um, they do have concerns about uh, immigration, uh, their social issues like that. We've got we've got Donald Trump in office. Why would they support a Max Abramson instead of Donald Trump, who it will likely be? I mean, I guess hypothetically, maybe Bill Well, but whoever the Republican is, why would they want to support you instead of the Republican candidate? Well, again, that, that's how you target the 14 uh, safe blue wall states, the Democrat states um, that there you you've got a tactical voting comes into play. In other words, if you live in uh, the Northeast, uh, states like Illinois, New Mexico, um, Colorado, any of the West Coast states or Hawaii, none of those 14 states ever goes uh, Republican. And I think that uh, just the just having a path to the White House, even an outside uh, long shot, 
uh, chance. I think that having somebody who's uh, a longtime supporter of Second Amendment, um, you know, kind of a Ron Paul, uh, Ron Paul type of libertarian who supports secure borders, although I'm pro-immigration, but I support secure borders. And uh, my uh, experience on the House Pro-Life Caucus, I'm pro-adoption, meaning that uh, the, the exceptions that I support, I think that adopt what we're trying to promote actually is adoption. Um, and I, I think that uh, that's that's a strong enough position where a lot of pro-life voters will kind of bite the bullet and support a, a libertarian, even though they may like Trump's most recent positions. If Trump isn't, doesn't have a chance of winning in any of those 14 states, that uh, you're much better off as a social conservative supporting a libertarian who at least isn't uh, far off to the left and uh, pro, uh, pro-abortion. pro um, I think that my stance is uh, opposing taxpayer funding of abortion and Planned Parenthood and my consistent voting record should uh, uh, appeal to those folks. Great. Uh, so let's shift to the economic side. Uh, we need we need to appeal to you got the economic left. Uh, classically, these are people who are worried about corporations doing evil corporate things. Uh, you've got the pay gap. Uh, what would you say to somebody who's maybe looking at voting for a Democrat or who is a registered Democrat and why you might be better to represent their interests? Also, the 28 safe Republican states, I, I, I think that they'll, they'll vote tactically for us. The messaging there um, is, as a matter of fact, not to go off on the side, but uh, about half of Democratic voters say that they would support middle class tax cuts. Uh, more than half of Democratic voters say that they'd like to reduce government spending, including not just wasteful government spending, but really downsized government. Uh, the vast majority of Democratic voters have said that they support term limits. Um, a majority support a balanced budget amendment. Um, the vast majority, more than two thirds, support tools like the line item veto to cut uh, government spending. So uh, when people say economic liberals, um, they may be suspicious of uh, the collusion between big, uh, big business and big government, but at the same time, they don't necessarily trust big government or think that, uh, you know, reckless spending and reckless borrowing is the solution to uh, curb the power of Wall Street. Um, what we've seen with the FDP in Germany is um, they take a pro-market rather than pro-business approach, and as long as they've stuck to pro-market or uh, the economics of principle, sticking to free markets, free trade. And, and consistently keeping government out of the marketplace, consistently opposing corporate welfare, consistently opposing corporate bailouts or uh, state protected monopolies or any of that cronyism that you see in, in state and national politics, um, that they will come over and they will they will support a candidate who is principled, even if uh, uh, they might prefer either a social democracy or even uh, nationalizing industries. Uh, when it actually comes down comes time to actually vote when they're seeing more and more of these establishment Democrats who are even more in the back pockets of Wall Street than sometimes their Republican opponent, um, then I think that uh, the third party vote is the only way. And especially for center left anti-establishment voters, um, we've seen them come over consistently and that's actually become one of our bigger voting bases when we're running an active campaign. Yeah, you bet. Uh, let's let's shift it over to the economic right now. This is pretty obvious. The debt's gotten big. You've already addressed that. But we're talking, uh, they see employers' rights dwindling, uh, a lot of just economic problems with the welfare state. What would you have to say, if they're thinking about voting for Donald Trump, why would they go for you instead? Of course, that's the small business community, um, economic conservatives. Uh, but some of them are pro-immigration. Um, our pro-immigration approach, I think, is a, a, a works much better for them. Donald Trump said that he was only going to go after illegal immigration. And probably 99% of Americans agree with that. Um, but when he's actually gotten in office, he's cut cut down visas. He's cut down, <coughs> excuse me, cut down visas for uh, students and uh, the the spouses of green card holders. Um, he's cut down on uh, migrant workers, and, and very, very few of those jobs would have gone to American citizens. I think 8% of uh, spouses of green card holders, if that. Um, so you have a lot of businesses, a lot of industries that, that depend very much on immigration. Uh, and of course, half the new businesses started in this country are started by first and second generation immigrants. 
but uh, the National Small Business Association polled their members. And of those who were Republican, only about half really felt that the Republican Party, the National Republican Party, they like what they see from Republican legislators. When they look at the National Republican Party, only about half really feel that they're being responsive to the concerns of small, the small business community. They really need, you know, not so much tax cuts and loan guarantees and the, and the like, but what they really need is a balanced budget. They're talking about the need for entitlement reform, regulatory reform, ending Obamacare, ending Obamacare mandates, getting health care costs down, which we hear about in the legislature all the time. I'm a member of the House Business Caucus. Um, but what they're really talking about um, are getting down the business taxes. Remember, small business owners get hit twice with whatever the tax burden is. You know, once the property taxes and the whole series of taxes on your home, but you also have a, a shop or a small business somewhere and you're getting hit twice and then you're getting hit with uh, some type of business profits tax from the state. Then you get hit with uh, sometimes uh, corporate income tax and a capital gains tax on your business. And so a lot of a lot of small business owners with, you know, revenues well below one million a year and maybe only a handful of employees are already being hit with effectively 50 to 70% tax rates when they start adding up all the hidden taxes that, that go with it. And it's, that's really, uh, it's really atrocious and it, it's something where they put their whole lives into it and um, their, their revenues are all being eaten up by taxes and regulatory fines and litigation and rising healthcare costs, like rising electricity costs are a big concern for uh, manufacturers. Um, and all of those have to be addressed. Energy costs are, are a major concern for uh, the business community. Oh, yeah. We had uh, Joe Paschal on recently to talk about a lot of the energy problems and uh, a lot of the a lot of the issues going on there. So I hate to do this to you, but now we got to take away your nomination. Let's get let's get you through a libertarian primary as a freshly registered libertarian. Uh, we got to get you through the nomination. So we're going to go left, right, bottom up. So let's talk about that libertarian left. You got kind of the, I mean, they'd say the libertarian socialists, but really just the libertarians that are really focused on the social issues. Uh, you know, you got the Mike Shipley's and the and, and them, and and they're very passionate. A lot of members of the Audacious Caucus come from there. What is your, what is your tactic for pulling in those those voters to make them support you when it comes to securing the nomination? Mike Shipley uh, is that is is a great friend. Um, I have a lot of terrific conversations with him. He always has something interesting to say, but he gave me a bottom up, not a pin, but a little attachment. I, I've, I've been a delegate uh, twice before at national conventions. And I said, bottom up unity. What is that? And I'm used to the Nolan chart. When I joined the libertarian party in 1996, although I didn't start paying dues until 2000. So got my old, uh, I've still got my, uh, card that I bring with me that I, that I flash to show off my, uh, my, my street cred. Um, he said, bottom up unity. I said, what is bottom or what is bottom unity? I thought we were the top because I'm used to the Nolan chart. And of course the Nolan chart, you know, I, yep. every time I've taken the world's smallest political quiz, I'm right in that top box. Me too. And, that, and that's too. what I'm, I'm kind of accustomed to. And then somebody flipped it around and now it's, it, it, it's upside down and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to turn my head sideways and squint. And I'm like, how does this, don't, why not just rotate it back around and, and, and put the good guys up at the top? Cause. Yeah, I think if you still have the I side with quiz, they still do the Nolan chart where the Liberty one's at the top. I uh, And the world's smallest political quiz, advocates yeah. for a smaller government. And, and you know, most of the groups, I think, still stick with the good old fashioned Nolan chart. Right. So <laughs> cool. All right. Well, uh, so you get, I mean, I already friends with Mike Shapley. That goes a long way. Let's talk about your appeal to the libertarian right. Uh, these are mostly, I, I think some people throw and caps in there, but a lot of paleo conservative, I think the Mises caucus isn't even afraid to call themselves the libertarian right. So uh, these are passionate. They have a lot of delegates. How do you appeal to them? Well, remember some, uh, some folks on the libertarian right are really even, philosophically libertarian like we are. So we would say what you choose to put into or take out of your own body is your own choice. Um, so obviously, you know, what you choose to eat, drink, smoke, uh, what you do with your own body, uh, sex laws, these types of things. And some on the right tend to say, well, for maybe for the federal government, but we still hear them come in on the social issues at the state legislature. And they still, you've got, uh, 
I hate to single anyone out, but the certain Southern Republican legislators are trying to pass bans on uh, uh, birth control pills and uh, things like that. That's really, really none of the government's business. The libertarian philosophy, if you really want to get right down to it, is is all the decisions that affect you are your own, and how you choose to spend your own money, of course, is is your own decision. Spend, save, invest, or donate as you see fit. Um, but when it comes to personal freedom, there are some people on the on the right, and especially some types of social conservatives and 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 prohibitionists who, yeah, they might agree with us on the national level, and they might vote for us on the national level. When it comes down to state legislature, um, they still want they like 50 different solutions to 50 different states, but the solution that they want for their state uh, might be I would consider it a little bit nosy or maybe even a, a comes across as a little bit of a busybody. If I want to go gamble my my money away, then that's my choice. If I want to uh, stay out until three o'clock in the morning at the bars, that's my choice. Um, and what an adult chooses to do with their own body among other consenting adults is uh, is really up to them. Yeah, totally agree. All right, well, let's talk about the the libertarian. Uh, let's let's start with the minarchists. Uh, this is the the bulk of the libertarian party i i would say is is the small government we agree defense fine i think that's even in our our planks is to say the one area the government should be maybe allowed to be in is the area of defense uh what would you what would your appeal be to kind of the minarchist moderate sort of libertarian uh I think our ability to sell constitutionally limited government to non-libertarians is probably the biggest appeal to minarchists. Um, I think that minarchists generally tend to be more pragmatic, not just on government, but they tend to be pragmatic on politics. Although uh, 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 I think that when I've gone door to door uh, and I've campaigned on the idea of just getting money, power, and decision-making back down to the local level and back to the people, taking care of problems at the local level, helping people at the local level, addressing uh, addiction, education, homelessness, literacy issues, uh, job training issues at the local level. Uh, most people, I think that that's a pretty easy sell. And I think that uh, you make the case as Ron Paul did when he ran for going back to the constitution, really downsizing the federal government uh, in order to get more accomplished through local churches, local charities, through the family, through local towns, local schools. I think that that, that really sells well with the vast majority of Americans. And when people see that, uh, people really turned on to that idea that that it's more cost effective, it's less partisan, and most importantly, you know the person with whom you're dealing. You're not just institutionalizing hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people and running them through some cold-hearted federal bureaucracy. You're helping one person at a time in your local town. Sure. And last, let's wrap up with the appeal to kind of the libertarian anarchist branch. This is uh, definitely growing. A majority of our candidates even uh, identify a as a libertarian anarchist at the moment the these are t they have a tough time even voting at all right because this is a lot of voting is violence and and assessing will but if they do vote it's got to be somebody who's principled and who is going to bring forward really ultimate freedom for them what would your appeal be to kind of an anarchist leaning person way back when i first got in i'm, I'm trying to think back maybe it was uh libertarian party of washington state convention in 2000 there were a handful handful of almost anarchists there and they said they were voting tactically and i tried to think of that in terms of of you know like the movie back to the future back to the future one michael j fox gets in the delorean and he goes back to good old 1955 in the eisenhower administration before the war on drugs before the war on crime before the war on terror um, this is kind of the ron paul message very very small very limited government just handling things at the local level. And I think of the Libertarian Party as a DeLorean that can go back to good old 1955, um, which is still in living memory, and it's, it's, it's a proven model of a very limited form of government that works. Now, we do have some members who'd like to go back to, you know, back to the future part three, good old 1885, the old Wild West days, and not even have to explain how to pay for roads and whatnot. And then you have a few people who would, who would go back uh, – even to 1785, when there wasn't even a federal government there, um, almost a true uh, anarchist, at least with, as far as the federal government is concerned. Maybe you'd have 
uh, states and counties and, and some other minimal institutions. But I, I think that um, we decided early on, and I think that this is the result of the Dallas Accord, which is, uh, what is it, 1974, uh, the party decided we're going to be a good old 1955 party. We're just going to go back to constitutionally limited government. If we ever make it, we may have to split. And you may then, once the American people are accustomed to constitutionally limited government, well, then at that point, we may need to split and break off uh, uh, some type of anarchist party that favors uh, absolutely no government at all. All right, yeah, there's a there's a long storied history between anarchy and liberty, and I've 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 gone down that rabbit hole a few times, but it is fascinating. Last two questions here, really just nuts and bolts questions. Uh, do you have a plan in place to help you raise money? Do you have the time to campaign? Now you've uh, been a state representative before, so you know what a campaign involves. It's a little bit tougher as a libertarian. I think a lot of worry with some of the candidates we put forward is they never intend to leave the basement. So do you have a plan in place to visit conventions, uh, drum up support, a fundraising strategy that would make it so that you'd be a viable candidate if you're selected? Yes. And uh, well, legislative campaigns are completely different from presidential campaigns. Um, we saw Governor Johnson, Governor Weld, um, tried to elevate their, their gubernatorial experience with the national and national is a much, much more scrutiny. Someone running for governor can usually just run on, uh, you know, here, here are some ideas I have for uh, reducing spending and reducing taxes. And, and both, of the, both the two governors did a, a really terrific job when, when they were in that uh, uh, position. But the number one money raiser we've seen historically is if you have a chance of winning, and that's always been the biggest problem that we faced. It's, it's, it's killed us in congressional campaigns, great congressional and legislative campaigns. And the legislative campaigns, libertarian campaigns that we've seen do really well are taking advantage of something called tactical voting. Um, most libertarian candidates um, are only vaguely aware of it. You have to know the, the PVI number of your district partisan voter index. And basically the way it breaks down, in a, a, a presidential campaign, as I said before, there are 14 states that that now never go re Republican, but yet back in let's say the days of Eisenhower uh, and even earlier campaigns, uh, you know Thomas Dewey and Wendell Wilkie and so forth, those those states, the northeastern states, especially New England and West Coast states, always went Republican every single year, and it was because it was a very different uh, Republican Party. It was really just more more dedicated to less government, uh, figuring out how to keep costs down and uh, reduce spending and taxes. Um, and the, the National Republican Party has, has figured out that uh, if they become even more socially conservative, more like the South, and maybe even right-wing populist like Donald Trump, they pick up more seats, more districts, and more votes down South, but they lose more in the Northeast and uh, the West Coast. Um, so they've kind of, they've kind of lost They've lost that. They've lost that ability. And I think that the Libertarian Party can can and should focus on, you know, not just the safe Republican districts where we kind of take on a rhino here and there. We need to counterbalance that and also focus on the 14 safe Democrat states and the 170 entrenched uh, Democrat House districts um, and and uh, run an even campaign for the presidency. Those 20 entrenched Republican states are competitive for us, they're not competitive for Democrats. The 14 entrenched Democrat states are competitive for us, they're not competitive for Republicans. So if we run an organized campaign ahead of time and we make it clear that we're gonna use this tactical voting approach, like they do in Canada, like they do in Britain, like they do in every other first past the post country, um, that while it may be a long shot, even having a one or two or 3% chance of winning the presidency brings in a whole lot more money than having zero chance and uh, just trying to make the case for, uh, you know, being a free educational campaign. I, I think that that uh, showing how we have some of the 14 states that don't go uh, Republican, that, that they could go libertarian and having uh, some of the 20 safe Republican states, especially the Rocky Mountain states, especially the Western states where we have large uh, numbers of libertarian uh, members and voters and activists. And there's a lot of a lot of interest out there. And uh, there's not a lot of campaigning by the Republicans. They just kind of put their name in and uh, let the party do the work and let, uh, 
you know, voter registration and the rest of it, do the work and just carry them into office. I think that having a, having a, a competitive race against uh, Republican legislators and Republican members of Congress who've never really had to do anything but win a primary before would bring a lot of people out of the woodwork and uh, boost voter turnout. I think that we'd, we'd pick up a few of those seats. But yeah. same thing for the presidential and for House of Representatives. It's, it's stay away from the battleground states and the battleground districts because we'll get out, spend a thousand to one there. The two parties spend about $4 billion uh, altogether every election cycle on those battleground states. And they do virtually nothing for the remaining 34 states. Right. All right. Well, uh, to close, last question. How do people find out about you if they want to get involved or have a question for you or want, want to donate? Where's the best place to find you? Uh, the best place that gets updated the most is my Facebook page, which is just Representative Max Abramson. Uh, we will be having uh, the, the the presidential one uh, once we put that together and get some get uh, more volunteers. We have a few volunteers already working. Um, and also, of course, MaxAbramson.org. That's the the campaign website that I've been using and has uh, all the announcements and press releases. If, if anybody's uh, uh, wants to go there for a link, maxabramson.org also has the link for uh, uh, donating. If you have uh, Bitcoin, Bitcoin cash, or just want to send in a contribution, that's uh, that's the best place to go to. But if you want to get involved in through social media, it's uh, representative Max Abramson. All right, Max, thank you so much for being on the show. We look forward to talking to you, getting to know you more. Uh, we've got an environmental debate coming up in less than two weeks here. We just look forward to seeing you on the stage. Again, welcome to the Libertarian Party and the uh, Libertarian uh, uh, primaries, and enjoy yourself and uh, keep spreading the message of liberty. Thank you very much. No problem. Thank you so much. Again, we're Libertarians. Thank you so much. If you are a Patreon donor, we really appreciate it. It keeps us going. It keeps us in business. Uh, we recently had our most downloaded episode of all time, uh, broke our 24-hour record and number of downloads, just all kinds of great stuff. We're just uh, getting bigger than ever. So again, thank you so much if you're tuning in. Uh, until next time, viewers, keep fueling the fires of liberty. <laughs>